Hello there, kia ora, and welcome along to the Music 101 interview podcast. I'm Charlotte Ryan, and I don't know about you, but I am obsessed with the brand new Fontaine's DC single. In fact, I think there's two out. There's one called Favourite, and I'm listening to it multiple times a day. It's from their upcoming album called Romance, which is out on the 23rd of August. This will be the Irish post-punk band's fourth album, and I don't know about you as well, but I feel like these songs are slightly happier. And I guess with the new album title Romance... Maybe love is in the air. I kind of think it is. And you know why? Well, last year I interviewed the frontman of Fontaine's DC called Green Chatham. He released a solo album called Chaos for the Fly, random album name, but don't be distracted by it because it's beautiful. I love Grian's solo album. It's kind of like Fontaine's DC but slightly turned down a little. On the album Grian Chatton sort of sings and then there's this really beautiful female backing vocalist which as you will hear is Grian's girlfriend who doesn't think she's a musician at all. I spoke to Grian Chatton about why he released a solo album in between Fontaine's DC albums. It was such a cool chat. He was so engaged and so honest. He's such a creative. It sounds like songs are just coming out of him all the time. And I thought this would be a great thing to listen to ahead of the new Fontaine's DC album. How are you feeling? I mean, the album's out now. This is your first debut album. What are your emotions like now that it's out in the world and you've started playing live? My reaction immediately every single time we we I've ever been involved in that and, and it's come out is to just run to the next thing you know I've kind of I don't know if it's maybe it's if it maybe comes from an inability to kind of stop and smell the roses but I like to have an album up my sleeve you know I feel more kind of comfortable when I have music that uh no one's heard yet I'm planning to release so I'm just going to go straight into writing again as soon as, as soon as this week is done <laughs> So Chaos for the Fly is out, but I understand, are you working on a new Fontaine's DC album? Mm. Yeah, always, you know. I'm in a good place creatively, I think, at the moment. And I'm, uh, you know, strike while the iron's hot and all that kind of crack. Of course. We say make hay while the sun shines in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, yeah. They're both kind of <laughs> relatively medieval kind of terms. Are you still writing all the time? I am, yeah, yeah. The kind of the balance would be more tipped in the favour of music. Mm. recently but yeah I feel I feel very kind of creatively uh fluent right now I don't feel like I think I think I've, I think I've just gone a lot deeper into it than I ever thought I would when I was growing up and obviously it being my kind of it being my only job has really afforded me that kind of extra time and space mental space to pursue it in that kind of way um and I find it you know I find it interesting how kind of how, how far you can take some things but I also like the idea of shaking it up and like picking up different instruments and seeing where the soul goes when you pick up a different aperture. When did you start even thinking about doing a solo album? I think I did it as a solo project just because it kind of maybe there was a certain level of autonomy that was attractive. But other than that, I kind of just I knew it wasn't a Fontaine's album. It wasn't necessarily where I wanted to take Fontaine's. You know, there's a song on the album called Bob's Casino, and that kind of arrived to me when I was looking at the sea in Dublin. Uh, one day, and it kind of it, it kind of arrived relatively fully formed, you know, with the sort of strings and the and the brass and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I just thought, yeah, like I, you know, I don't really want to, I don't want to compromise on this, and I don't want to pass it through any filters. I just kind of want to do exactly what's in my head, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that's I, I did it. Bob's Casino is one of my favourite tracks on the album. I wondered if it, it was actually based on a casino. Is there actually a casino called Bob's Casino? Yeah, there were. I mean, it's. I think it's just shut down. Like after I wrote the track, I don't think my track shut it down. <laughs> but I think uh, it's a place that I kind of grew up around. You know, I, I moved around a lot when I was a kid, but it was always kind of around this town called Scarries in North County Dublin. It was, it's a really nice seaside town, you know. And there's a casino that's on the waterfront. We used to go in there and play pool when we were kids and kind of buy sweets there and stuff and just stay there for kind of a couple of hours. And uh, then my friends all got jobs there every summer. And it was just a kind of, it was a little bit of a hub, you know, and it had that kind of nice duality of both, I suppose, both young people and then maybe their parents, you know, kids and their parents would kind of both be entertained by their own respective uh, forms of entertainment. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's just an interesting atmosphere, you know. I can't imagine a casino with a sea view. Now that you mention that, I don't. I don't know if there was actually much of a view. <laughs> I have to say, I think it was one of those things where once you go in, you're in. Yes. You know, and I think that's 
that's that's probably that's probably there's probably a point to that. There's probably a pur- purpose to that, isn't there? I think if you're if you watch the sun come up and go down from behind the slot machine um, over the sea, you, you you'll probably be a little bit more intensely aware of what you're doing with your time. You know. Yeah, yeah. I think there's rules: no clocks and no windows. So yeah, you lose concept of time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty it's bleak. <laughs> Well, I'm kind of intrigued because when I listen to your music, some of your some of your lyrics could be said to be bleak, like but in a really beautiful way, like beautiful songs with these lush orchestral strings. But then if you listen to your lyrics, you're perceptive of things. I like the way that you see the darkness and things too. I think. Yeah, thanks. I've I've always I've always kind of been one for subversion. I suppose you know I like kind of I like the sleight of hand thing. I like kind of something being shown to you. Uh, you, you know, kind of like looking behind it and realizing that the mechanisms behind the apparently happy thing that you're seeing are uh, maybe dark. Do you call yourself a poet? You know, do you write lyrics and words before the music comes? Very, very often, yeah. But what, what I what I usually do is I kind of use poetry. I, I write a lot of poetry, but just for myself, really. And I'm aware that it has a kind of maybe an, a, a function in that it keeps that aspect of my brain quite fit, maybe. Because mm. I, I like doing that, but I don't really like, as much as I used to, I don't really like kind of stuffing poetry into music, you know? So I kind of use the poetry writing as a method to kind of remain kind of uh, fit with kind of creative writing. And then when, when a song comes up and I've got the melody and everything and it's time to write the lyrics, I, I usually have a few nice cards at the top of the deck, you know, from the work I've done with the poetry. I'm Irish, like, you know, you can't really, you can't, it's difficult to call yourself a poet in Ireland without, you know, people telling you that you've got notions. That's what we call it in Ireland, you know. He's got notions now, you know. He's moved to London, he's got notions. What does that mean? To have notions is like uh, to have a to have a maybe fantastical view of yourself. <laughs> so, also you're a type of person if you're a poet, if you're an Irish poet. Yeah, if you think you're an Irish poet, you know, um, <laughs> you'd, you'd leave other people to call you a poet. You know, you'd, you wouldn't dare call yourself a poet. It's kind of like you know, you, you you wouldn't necessarily call yourself a saint. You know, a lot of people dream of the success that Fontaine's DC has had. Did you dream of that success when you were young? You know, I probably dreamed of taking the place of rock stars that I idolised, you know. Mm. When I was a kid, I had the bullet in a Bible by Green Day. You know, the, the, the live shot, and it's a huge gig, and it's a, it's a DVD. And, you know, when I was a kid, I, I, I just thought that kind of standing above a sea of people commanding them. Uh, not commanding them, that's, that's a different kind of job. Um, but kind of just having that, having that effect um, and maybe... Maybe com- commanding a certain amount of adoration was something that, as a very uh, shy uh, kid, that was really attractive to me, you know. But I, I don't think I ever, I certainly never dreamed of kind of the the practicalities of it, you know, the kind of like, uh, you know, how how smelly a bus can get and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> I, I wasn't I wasn't prepared for that. No, but, but um, yeah, dreams versus reality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a it's a double edged sword, but I I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, you know. Are you cynical? Might be quite a hard word, but are, are you cynical about the music industry? Uh, yeah, I, and I I think I, th- I think I'm right to be, you know. I think that there's. Um, it's it's maybe it's not as as apparent as a, as a, as it was in the kind of you know sixties seventies eighties, but neither is uh, I suppose um, the you know the legal system or or the kind of you know methods of control that like you know um, you know you know you know how Foucault talks about how kind of this is getting wildly uh, kind of deep all of a sudden I don't know why I picked no, this out here but this is where my brain went but you know how it, he kind of talks about um, how the this the system, you know, there, there used to be the kind of the guillotine in, in the town square, right? Mm. <laughs> I can't believe I'm talking about it. Yeah, where are we? The- there used to be the guillotine in the town square, and that was the kind of that was the kind of uh, the state's way of uh, showing that they're upholding their end of the bargain by exerting their uh, punishment over somebody who did something wrong. Yes. And that's kind of what they did. And then they kind of they moved the guillotine behind the prisons, and then they moved them into the prisons. So it's they're still there, but it's not kind of as apparent. Anyway, I'm just saying that there's still vultures and vampires, you know, but they kind of dress like normal people. That's good. That's so good. How is <laughs> um, how is your sleep these days? I don't mean to sound like a therapist, but I know that you've suffered quite badly from an insomnia. It's it's uh, it's all right now, actually, at the moment. Thanks for asking. You know, kind of, it, it's. I don't know if you have ever had trouble with your sleep, but it's kind of like if you lose two nights, it's really hard to get it back on track. Yeah. 
because you you're convinced that it, you're gone. And when the when the third night comes around, it's it's hard, it's hard to kind of allow yourself to allow yourself to believe that you might be able to go to sleep now. You know, you think you're just you're just in a, in a patch. But it's all right at the moment because I, I think largely down to the fact that uh, myself and my my partner Georgie have moved back into Camden, which is a an area we have some experience living in in London, and uh, our flat is relatively homely and there's a consistency and routine to my life, which allows me to relax a bit. You know. Camden's quite a cool, crazy, it's a very creative musical place where it ha- always had that reputation. Is it still as creative and sort of the hive of live music? Um, there's a lot going on, you know. I think a lot of the people that would have popped, a lot of the kind of youth that would have populated in, in the sort of 2000s, you know, during the times of the sort of Libertines and Amy Winehouse and stuff like that, a lot of a lot of the modern day equivalent of those people will probably be located in East London at the moment, mm-hmm. which allows for a little bit more space here, maybe. But there's, the venues are still there. People still come to Camden for for the events, you know. I think I require a certain level of stimuli, certain amount of stimuli, really, in order for me to be able to relax. And I think that's probably partly down to the fact that I've spent a lot of time touring mm-hmm. and going from that to to. Uh, to a silent sea is just a bit too much of a drop off, you know, and it's hard hard to adjust to. So I, I need a certain amount of life around me, you know. Georgie's voice and her backing vocals or singing on the album is so beautiful. Is she a musician as well, or did you have to convince her to sing on your album? She she wouldn't uh, she wouldn't call herself a musician, but I would. Yeah, mm. um, she's uh, she's very shy. She's downstairs. I hope she's not listening. Um, <laughs> she's. Uh, she, she's only ever sang really kind of in front of me and, and other people um, when we've kind of, you know, had a couple of cans together and passed the guitar and, you know, and she kind of gets the, the, the confidence then. But she's always had a really obviously lovely voice mm. and she always kind of surprises people whenever she whenever she opens her mouth to sing. Um, I think she's just got a really nice kind of voice in general, speaking voice and everything. And it's just, there's a certain huskiness to it, which is beautiful. It can't be affected, I think. Mm. And so will she perform? Can you convince her to perform live with you? You know, does she do live backing vocal? Um I would love her to do that. I don't know I don't know if she would. No. But there's no there's no immediate plans for me to tour this, you know, uh as well because I've got I've got a couple of acoustic shows left this week, um, just to kind of promote the release of the album around England. But apart from that, I've got, I think after after this week, I've got like five weeks before we go on tour with the Arctic Monkeys with Fontaine's DC. So I'm going to have to kind of start adjusting myself mentally, uh, get myself ready for that. So we, we won't be touring it properly. But if, if it ever comes around, maybe like next year, I'd love to get her involved, yeah. So you've got, I think it's over 30 dates in America. How do you prepare, because of the insomnia and because of, you know, the extent of and the damage sometimes touring can do to mental health, how do you prepare for a tour like that? What I'd really like to do is get to a point where I'm sort of deeply content in my own company, and I, I, I don't think I don't think I've I think I've lost that over the last couple of years of touring and stuff. And I think if I can get back into that place, then I'll have enough of a kind of integrity, enough of a foundation within myself to last the tour without breaking. Hopefully, you know that's my plan. I've got faith in you. You'll do it. Cheers. <laughs> Good luck, Rian. And thank you so, so much for the time today. And congratulations on Chaos for the Fly. I just love it so much. Cheers. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. This is a Music 101 podcast, and I was speaking with Grian Chatton about his solo album, Chaos for the Fly. He is the front man for Fontaine's DC, uh, the Irish post-punk band who have a brand new album out next month. It's called Romance. Anyway, go and listen to Chaos for the Fly especially after you've heard the details of all the songs. And go and listen to that new single by Fontaine's DC2, Favourite, which I'm completely addicted to. Until next time, like, share, I'll see you soon.